Welcome to today's webinar, The Fundamentals of Risk Management in Insurance, Viewed Through the Lens of Emerging Technology, brought to you by NCSL. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Representative George Kaiser. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this NCSL webinar titled The Fundamentals of Risk Management and Insurance, Viewed Through the Lens of Emerging Issues. This seminar, webinar is presented in collaboration with the Institute's Grip Insurance Education Foundation. I'm George Kaiser of North Dakota, co-chair of the NCSL Insurance Task Force. I am joined today by Frank Paul Tomasello, Senior Director of the Institute's Griffith Foundation, who will serve as the moderator of today's program, and Dr. Kevin Shaver of the University of Pittsburgh. In just a moment, I will turn things over to these gentlemen. But first, for those unfamiliar with the NCSL Insurance Task Force, let me note that its mission is, one, to engage members in policy discussions, two, educate members, and three, extend networking opportunities to legislative leaders on insurance issues through a series of well-defined programs, webinars, and policy forums. In keeping with that mission, we are pleased to collaborate with Mr. Tomasello and his team at the Institute's Griffith Foundation to present today's nonpartisan and non-advocative discussion of the underpinning of risk management and insurance viewed through the lens of emerging technologies. Thank you all of, to all of you who have joined us today, and I turn it over to Frank Tomasello. Thank you, Representative Kaiser. Uh, I, I speak for the entire team here at the Institute's Griffith Foundation in saying that the pleasure is all ours. Uh, our organization's shared commitment to educating public policymakers is at the core of this collaborative relationship. Uh, as many of you may know, the Institute's Griffith Foundation is a leading resource for objective insurance information for policymakers here in the United States. Uh, insurance and risk management play an important role in the financial fabric of our country, protecting many aspects of our personal lives, professional endeavors, and national economy. Uh, our mission is to empower policymakers through a greater understanding of risk management. We conduct a variety of nonpartisan, non-advocative seminars on risk management presented by leading scholars from top universities, and among them is Dr. Kevin Shaver, uh, a lecturer at the University of Pittsburgh, who joins us today. Dr. Shaver earned his Ph.D. degree at Washington University in St. Louis. His research focuses on the nature of competitive, uh, I should say competition and innovation in insurance markets, uh, and beyond his academic experience, Dr. Shaver's professional background includes two years at the Hartford where he analyzed insurance markets and developed and managed a variety of insurance products. Uh, throughout our presentation, should you have questions for Dr. Shaver, you may type them into the online interface on your computer screen. There is a question box on your screen, and it's designed specifically for that purpose. We'll allot some time at the end of the program for Q&A, and we'll do our best to uh, address questions that come in. Uh, now, without uh, any further ado, I'd like you to join me in welcoming to our microphones uh, Dr. Kevin Shaver. Uh, Dr. Shaver, some might describe risk management and insurance as the grease, as it were, that allows our economic machinery to operate. Uh, would you agree with that description or metaphor, uh, and or how would you describe the role of risk management and insurance in our economy? Uh Thank you, Frank. Well, well, first of all, I absolutely agree with that. And, uh, you know, one might think that I'm biased uh, because I uh, have studied insurance markets so much, but uh, I would, would caution against that. It's really about uh, I take that position because uh, the more you look at insurance, the more you uh, recognize the important role it plays in our, uh, in our national economy um, and, in fact, the world economy. And uh, so hopefully this over the next uh, – a uh, few minutes, I'll be able to set that up and help uh, everyone, you know, if you haven't noticed that before, develop an appreciation for the importance of, of insurance to our economy. Uh, just before I, I continue, I just want to thank uh, Representative Kaiser and, uh, and the Institute's uh, Griffith Foundation for the opportunity to uh, be here and speak uh, today. It's always a pleasure to have the opportunity to talk about um, in a nonpartisan sort of educational fashion, 
uh, how, you know, how we understand the way uh, insurance markets function and their importance. So uh, it's a real pleasure, as I was saying. So let me, let me get back to your question then, Frank. And, and, I, and let me apologize just for a second. I've had a cold, so my voice might be a little bit off today. Um, but I'll do my best with this. So, um, so when we think about uh, insurance, uh, I think we want to take one step back. Uh, and I think what we want to do is think about risk itself. Uh, and in a sense, risk is something that uh, we really take for granted. I mean, it's, not, it's something that we worry about and we notice at points. But what I don't think we think about is how – um, how present it is in our lives, how it's a constant. Uh, and uh, when you start to pay attention to the risks we face and the role insurance plays in um, addressing those risks, you start to appreciate, uh, I think, on a much deeper level, the importance of the insurance markets. So let me scoot ahead to, um, to this slide here to take a, a, a second to think through this a little more carefully. So as I was noting, the risk is, uh, you know, is really everywhere. And, you know, when we think about this, this could be risk of just becoming ill and not being able to work. This could be the risk that you uh, take every time you get into your car and drive to the grocery store, uh, you know. Or uh, this could be the risk of, um, uh, you know, becoming ill during your retirement and not having the money to, um, uh, to pay for the care that you might need to receive. Um, these sorts of things are, are risks we think of as individuals, uh, but you can also then think about uh, the types of risks uh, that businesses face that are important to, to transactions in the economy on the business side. So uh, many companies would be in very big trouble if they weren't able to access liability insurance. Uh, you know, workers in, might have, uh, would be exposed to a great deal more risk without workers' comp. And so, one of the things I would, uh, at the very front end of this conversation, one of the things I'd want everyone to stop and think about is, well, okay, given all the risk we face out there, what would the U.S. economy look like if there was no insurance, if there was no way for you to buy protection from that risk uh, that's out there uh, through markets? You know, so that would mean no health insurance. So individuals uh, would be, most Americans would be living uh, with the constant threat of uh, an illness that could uh, mean financial ruin, or maybe that they couldn't even afford to pay for their medical care. Uh, you know, we can think about auto insurance. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's reassuring to have um, comprehensive coverage. So if there's a, a storm and a tree falls on your car, you know you're not out all of that money. Um, you'll be able to get that car replaced up to the level at least you've got coverage. Uh, and then liability insurance. Think about all the situations where uh, protection from liability is critical for business ventures. Uh, and I hope what, what sort of comes from this, uh, as one thinks through this, is that uh, is an awareness of how important insurance is to uh, a well-functioning modern economy. Uh, and in that and when we think about that, that, that really brings us to the idea that efficient insurance markets uh, are one thing that underpins uh, the U.S. economy. Uh, now, it's not, again, as I said earlier, it's something that's easy to overlook. We sort of take insurance for granted. It's something that's there. We have to buy it if we want to drive. Um, but at the same time, it, it really serves to, uh, to reduce the cost of making transactions in our economy. Uh, in a way that really allows our economy to uh, function effectively. All right, and let me, let me take a moment here. Uh, as I go forward in this, I'm going to talk about things that are good for markets. Uh, I'll use sort of terminology like that. Uh, I want to be really clear. As an economist, uh, I'm talking about when I say it makes a market work well or is good for a market, I mean it makes it more efficient. And efficiency is our basic sort of – scientific concept by which we judge the performance of markets. Uh, are they working effectively? Uh, what it isn't is uh, an assertion about whether markets should work in a certain way uh, about, you know, in terms of policy. Um, and, and so that's really critical. The goal here when I'm talking about the performance of insurance markets is to, to lay down a baseline about the actual functioning as if insurance markets are machines, not making a judgment about 
should they work one way or the other? Um, now, that's, of course, a really critical question. Uh, how should these things work on that more normative or policy level? Um, and my argument here is that, and the standard argument in economics as well, is that, well, in order to make good policy, uh, we need to have the baseline understanding of how things actually work, right? And then we build on top of that. So I'm hoping to give you uh, today a good overview of that baseline. All right. Well, so, okay, we have this idea then that, that you know, risk is present and insurance is one of the ways that we address that and that that's important to the performance of the economy. So this brings us then to this, the topic of the talk, so technology, insurance, and risk, right? How are, these, how are changes in technology affecting insurance and risk in our economy? So let's think about the first, uh, take the first bullet point here. So how has technological progress altered risk? Well, certainly one thing we can say is that uh, there are new risks that develop as technology changes. Uh, you know, you might take, for instance, over the last 15 years, uh, the, the increasing risk of identity theft. Right, that, it, that comes hand in hand with the increase in technology and new, the new amounts of financial transactions that take place online. Right? So, uh, so that's one example of a, a very significant risk, one that is present now and that insurance companies are developing products for um, that uh, wasn't present uh, before technological advance of, you know, say, the last 20 or so years. Uh, there's also this, this tendency for technological pro progress to lessen other types of risks. Uh, I was lucky enough to be born at a, after the polio vaccine was uh, developed and then distributed. So that's never been a risk that I've faced. Of course, my father faced that risk, right? And so technology has a way of creating new risks, but also uh, getting rid or reducing other risks. So that's going to be a fundamental uh, principle that we have to deal with a, a constant uh, as uh, as we look forward as to where insurance is going in the future. Right? Uh, another thing we can think about is that technology is changing the way insurance markets uh, work and what companies can provide and how we can manage risk itself right? rather than altering the risks in some direct sense. Uh, so a couple of areas where that's really been prevalent uh, as of late in the last couple decades uh, computing power has increased dramatically. That's allowed insurance companies to, uh, to process uh, and, and individuals and rate them or give them money or give, charge them a certain amount of money for insurance policies uh, in a way that was just not possible before. Uh, if you go into uh, – uh, uh, if you take a look at an insurance product today, uh, say for auto insurance, uh, there will be an insurance company will will literally be potentially setting uh, millions of different prices uh, based on consumer characteristics. Uh, and in fact, that's really an underestimate. It's it's in the billions uh, at least for most companies. Uh, whereas if you think about um, 10 years or 20 years ago, let's go even 30 years ago, uh, we would have been talking on the order of maybe a couple hundred different prices uh, based on characteristics of the, the potential of the insured. Um, so computing power has made a huge difference in what insurance companies can do on the pricing side, but also their ability to manage risk itself. Uh, there's another element here, this, this idea of its, its computing power is more diffuse. Uh, it used to be if you went into any independent agent's uh, office uh, to buy an insurance policy, they would have tables on their desk where they could calculate your rates uh, by hand. Uh, that's, of course, no longer true. There are computers and online inter interfaces that, can, that agents use today, uh, and that creates a, a very different insurance experience for consumers. Uh, another component here that's related is data collection and then the management of that data. So insurance companies today collect vast amounts of data, and, and data has always been an important piece of uh, the business of insurance, knowing the uh, characteristics of individuals that you are uh, insuring uh, and being able to assess the potential cost of insuring them has always been important. But today with the technology that exists, the computing power, uh, we just see this increasing uh, it, by orders of magnitude. So this is a very big change in insurance, and it's one that we can only expect to continue uh, in, the, in the coming years. Uh, and then this last category here is another uh, component that is related to first two, and it's telematics technologies. And 
this has started out in, in various niches of insurance. So auto insurance is a place where it's really taken hold. Uh, and telematics uh, technologies are really technologies that, um, that, that measure in real time, typically, uh, the performance uh, or the behavior of uh, an insured. So, for instance, in, in auto insurance, uh, you might have an insurance company may have a technology where they actually measure the speed at which people drive, the times they drive, and where they drive through the smartphone of the driver uh, that they're insuring. Or it could be a, 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 something that's attached, some device that's attached to the vehicle and monitors the vehicle's performance. Right? Uh, but this just goes back to this point about increasing the collection of data. Um, that you know, these technologies uh, really open up new data, and that's fantastic for insureds, but it also creates new issues. And I'll talk more about those things as we go forward. Uh, the other thing I would mention on telematics is, uh, you know, I gave you this example of auto insurance, but this is quickly moving into homeowners insurance now with as, as houses develop more smart, te as, as smart technologies develop for houses, we're seeing more of this for homeowners. We're seeing this for renter's insurance now. And so we can expect that these things may very well continue uh, and become a much bigger uh, component of insurance uh, broadly in the coming years. Uh, and then finally, uh, a brief comment about what, what sort of change we might expect on the horizon. Now, this sort of thing, of course, I've already mentioned that these, uh, these, the previous things I mentioned are probably going to continue. So we expect to see more telematics technology, uh, increasing focus on data collection, and certainly computing power. So we expect all of that to continue to change insurance. Uh, but then there are also a number of uh, other interesting things that are, that are happening. Uh, blockchain would be one example. Uh, this is really you know, a byproduct of cryptocurrencies, uh, and it's a very secure way of, of effectively uh, recording transactions. I mean, and uh, there are a lot of potential insurance implications, uh, tying insurance together uh, with some sort of blockchain technologies. Uh, now, this is at its infancy, and so it'll be interesting to see where this goes. Uh, but you can imagine uh, the, be the ability to verify the backgrounds of, uh, you know, potential insured through blockchain technology, um, making payments for claims conditional upon blockchain uh, records. Um, so there's, there are all sorts of things, and those are just guesses. We'll, we'll see where it goes. As I said, this is really at an early stage. Uh, and then uh, the third point here, just briefly, is, uh, that we're seeing a, a radical change uh, in types of insurance products because of the technology. Uh, I was just uh, in the Wall Street Journal just the other day. There was uh, an article on traveler's insurance reinventing renter's insurance uh, for millennials. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, they're developing a, uh, an insurance, a renter's insurance policy uh, that can be managed uh, through smartphones, that isn't tied to a particular apartment uh, where, you know, there are possibilities, and this is going a little beyond their product, where consumers can decide to turn the insurance on and off with just a swipe on their phone. Uh, so they can choose when they have coverage. Uh, so there are a lot of things that potentially are changing uh, as uh, the technologies that we use, like smartphones, um, uh, become uh, a bigger part of our lives, and in thus insurance products. Uh, might look very different 15 years from now, 20 years from now. Indeed. So, uh, Dr. Faber, uh, oh, yes. Frank Tomasello here uh, at the Griffith Foundation. Um, with respect to your comments on how information and data are changing insurance and doing so at a pretty rapid clip, uh, mm -hmm. we have a, uh, our first question submitted from uh, a participant uh, asking specifically about telematics. Uh, and uh, the question goes to uh, this notion of, uh, consumer approval uh, in order to uh, perhaps receive a lower rate for car insurance or home yeah. insurance, the, uh, the sort of more recent development leveraging telematics data. Uh, can you speak to that, and do you know uh, in terms of uh, uh, providers uh, offering this kind of uh, benefit right now? Um, yeah. Their permission well, I, to be required and what privacy issues might be in play there? Right. Well, so this is a great question. So. Uh, so certainly there are privacy issues here. Uh, so my understanding right now is so it varies by state by state. And so some states have been um, more open to uh, to the use of telematics technologies. Uh, 
California, for instance, has allowed a very limited use. Um, but then you have some other states that have been, uh, you know, much more willing to allow um, uh, telematics data. You've often had, uh, in many states, you've had a situation where uh, telematics isn't allowed to, um, the data used in telematics can be only used to provide a discount to consumers. Uh, and, uh, you know, and so I guess as, a, as, a, as an economist, when I look at how insurance markets work, um, while ostensibly that is, uh, you know, reducing the telematics, the information that's derived from telematics might tell a company that someone's less risky than they thought uh, otherwise would have known and thus charge them a lower rate. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, the, the problem with, with that sort of approach uh, as an economist is uh, it, what it does then is it, it pulls people out of the pool that, um, of people that aren't using telematics that are relatively low risk. Uh, and so that overall pool of people that aren't using telematics uh, will start to look like a riskier group of people. And then through normal regulatory um, rate changes, uh, you would expect to see the prices go up for those individuals. And so uh, I, would be, I would caution uh, the even if ostensibly a telematics technology is only used to lower rates, I would caution people against seeing that as really just keeping rates lower. It will probably affect those that don't use rates um, through a channel such as that. Uh, so it's a tricky issue. Uh, and, and, you know, I, this, is a, this is really an issue that, uh, it's certainly not settled, and states are, and state legislators are really going to have to think about, uh, well, what is the appropriate policy in these settings? How, you know, how are these technologies going to be used uh, in a way that we're comfortable with? Um, and you know, I expect that's going to evolve over time. And uh, you know, so what we see five years from now, uh, as we get more experience with these technologies and as they evolve. Uh, I expect it, you know, that, you know, they, those initial efforts will change. Um, I don't know if, I hope that answers the question. If there's a follow-up to that, I'd be happy to talk more about that. Thank you, Dr. Shaver. We appreciate it. Great. Um, so, so fantastic. So thanks for that question. It's a, like I said, it's a fantastic question. So, um, okay, so then, so let, let, what I want to do now is briefly talk about risk management, uh, just to get a broad overview of, of risk management techniques. Um, and then we're going to dive back into insurance and think about how insurance relates uh, to these issues. So, uh, you know, if we think about, you know, big brush strokes, risk management, uh, you know, the four bullet points on this slide really capture the, the, the key elements. Uh, you know, with risk management, one of the first components is we have to identify the risks we face. Uh, and uh, once we identify those risks, uh, the, the next step is to analyze them to determine, well, uh, what's the likelihood of these scenarios uh, occurring? Uh, what type of uh, results would there be if one of these scenarios occurs? How big of a loss might be associated with a particular outcome? Right? Now, and this is, of course, not an exact science, but you know, it, one makes one's best effort to understand the risks they're facing and the potential costs. Uh, upon recognizing those scenarios, the potential uh, risks one faces, um, uh, then we move on to this sort of idea of mitigating those risks. Uh, and so that mitigation could take the form of prevention. You know, might, might be able to avoid the risk altogether uh, with appropriate action. Or maybe it's a, an issue of reducing the risk uh, and accepting, you know, uh, some amount of risk, but uh, still, uh, you know, dealing with it in a way that uh, seems appropriate. Uh, and then we get to this final element. Well, once we've sort of thought about how we could reduce and prevent uh, you know, then there's this last question about, you know, well, if we can't get, can't get rid of all this risk, do we want to retain that risk or should we transfer that risk to someone else? Uh, and so that becomes, you know, this is where insurance comes back in. And it's, this is a complicated question. So retaining the risk, and certainly some risks are, are you know, the costs aren't particularly high and individuals uh, can comfortably uh, take that risk on. Uh, you know, and so it's uh, probably the least expensive way if you can withstand the, the volatility or the variability that comes with that risk is to just take the risk on yourself. Uh, but other exposures uh, can be too big to handle, so such, such as, you know, a significant health setback it could cost millions of dollars to treat. And uh, most individuals uh, in America don't have the money to, 
uh, to spend at any given point on, you know, an extensive uh, regime of health treatments. And so uh, financial ruin would be an obvious consequence of that. And so the, the answer here then for, for these types of risks, these uh, more ruinous types, uh, is to transfer that risk. So some, some loss exposures uh, uh, can be managed through transfer. Uh, now, this is going to be the financial side typically. Uh, uh, and, and this is really, you know, if you stop back and think about it, we take it for granted, but this is pretty, it's, it's pretty fantastic. You go back, you know, say uh, 2,000 years, the ability to transfer risk didn't exist. Right? And so, uh, you know, at this point now, it seems, you know, very ordinary. But, um, you know, being able to shift the risk to someone who can bear that risk uh, turns out to be a very valuable piece of business in our economy. And so insurance is really the most uh, common way of transferring risk. Uh, and one thing that's, I'll say a little bit more about this later, one thing that's cool about insurance <clears throat> is that not only do you transfer the risk to someone else, the way the insurance company says that you've transferred the risk to you uses it, it may actually get rid of that risk. The risk may disappear uh, based on the way they manage the risks they're taking on. So risk is not some constant that never goes away. Uh, depending on how we organize the risks we face, we can oftentimes uh, reduce risk uh, overall. All right, so let's think then a little bit more carefully about what insurance is. And of course, we all have an intuitive idea, uh, and that's probably something along the lines of this first bullet point, that, we're, that you use insurance to protect financial interests uh, from losses, so an auto accident, uh, a health incident, uh, liability, someone slips on the ice in your stairs and is injured, and your homeowner's policy co covers the liability uh, of, that, you're, that you hold, have for that. Um, but I guess the other component I would say that's important is to think about this uh, in terms of uh, being a, really a legal contract, right, it deals with financial consequences. It has to be specified uh, carefully between the insured, the person buying insurance, and the insurance company. Uh, and when we think about insurance as a legal contract, that's when we start to think a little bit more about some of the difficulties that consumers face uh, when they're purchasing insurance. Because they turn, you know, certainly contracts, not everyone has a, a legal background and contracts can be difficult to understand. Uh, and insurance as a product is also a complicated product. And so, uh, you know, it, it is at its core a contract, uh, but that is a strength and potentially, you know, a drawback to insurance as a product. All right, so let's think about the benefits of insurance then briefly, too. Uh, so uh, for insureds, the people that are buying insurance, well, it covers losses, so it indemnifies them from those losses. Uh, that's a clear benefit. They are able to avoid risk. Uh, you know, a separate side of that is it reduces uncertainty in their lives, so people are able to plan more effectively. Uh, and so that uh, certainly makes, uh, for a lot of people, uh, uh, has a lot of value. Uh, it also, and this may be a little less, you know, clear at first, but it encourages an efficient, a more efficient use of resources. Uh, you might think about someone who's uh, potentially they're thinking, well, maybe I want to start a business. I have this knowledge and the potential to start a business that I think would be successful. Uh, but at the same time, uh, if they don't have access to health insurance, they have to worry about what if, I, what if my, someone in my family gets sick? Will, sick? Will I have the resources to take care of them? Well, without health insurance, right, uh, they may not go ahead and engage, develop that business because they feel like they have to keep those resources uh, present for the potential of a health setback, right? But with health insurance, they can pay a, a premium. It's a relatively small amount. And then they still can open up those resources to starting that, that business, right? So uh, in, in many ways, insurance promotes efficient uses of resources, ones that strengthen an economy. All right, so what about... Um, in the, the benefit of insurance to businesses and society, well, you can think about situations where uh, insurance supports the ability to access credit. Uh, most people who borrow money to buy a house or a car uh, will have some sort of insurance uh, uh, associated with that contract in order to make that loan uh, acceptable, right? So, uh, you know, mortgage insurance is a standard uh, in the U.S. economy. So, Insurance uh, helps those transactions, uh, helps e ease those transactions. Oftentimes, there are legal requirements for insurance. And so that's, that's a clear uh, benefit from insurance. Uh, businesses oftentimes need to protect themselves from risk, uh, and so it provides, uh, insurance provides an opportunity for that. 
we also, uh, you know, when insurance companies collect a fair, a significant amount of money in premiums, uh, and oftentimes they don't have to pay that back, back out immediately in the form of claims. Uh, and so there are a lot of investments that insurance companies make. Um, and so, uh, so there are benefits associated with that. Insurance also reduces social burdens. Uh, you might think about uh, long-term care insurance uh, and the ability of uh, people to take care of themselves in their uh, old age uh, it takes a burden off of society for uh, taking care of people that are elderly and unable to take care of themselves and their families of people uh, who are in those situations. Right? So, so those are just to name a few benefits. Um, so, but then, of course, there are always costs associated uh, with uh, insurance. Uh, and so, obviously, premiums uh, for insurance. Uh, insurance providers, well, of course, if they're going to provide insurance, uh, there are costs like operating costs. They have to earn a profit as well. Uh, pay individuals to work for the company. There's a potential for fraud uh, and inflated claims. Uh, and then there's also claims that occur because uh, when you insure someone, you protect them from the risks that they face. That means they may not be, they may change their behavior. They may not be as cautious as they would have been uh, because those risks aren't as present. Uh, and so there may be more, more claims, more losses because of this. Uh, and then finally, there can be frivolous losses uh, that are costly as well. Dr. Schaefer, right. uh, Frank yeah. Tomasello uh, at Griffith, wondering if uh, you might take a moment or two to, to speak a bit about the promise of technology to perhaps reduce the costs associated with insurance fraud, which you spoke of uh, just a moment ago. Yeah. And then as a follow-up, if you could, uh, maybe talk a bit about that new technology uh, and whether uh, with that technology we might see perhaps new opportunities for fraudulent activity, essentially the other side of, of that question, as it were. Sure. Yeah. Well, so... So of course, uh, so this is a good question as well. Um, uh, well, certainly. I, so we, we see technology changing, uh, and oftentimes in one way it makes things more secure, and then in another way uh, it creates opportunities for people that are trying to take advantage. Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, it's it's uh, one has to be careful. Um, you know, so for instance, uh, I, it's, it can give you an example of, of, of a number of ways where technology uh, has uh, reduced some of the the risks, uh, uh, the types of fraud that might exist uh, uh, that are that are pretty present. Uh, you might have uh, noticed, for instance, um, uh, you see it less now, but progressive insurance, auto insurance, for a long time, uh, they tried to settle claims very quickly, and so they had lots of cars or trucks. Uh, that were branded with the word progressive on the side that were constantly on the roads. Uh, and what they were doing was using technologies that had become available uh, for them to, um, to, to respond to accidents almost in real time and then collect better information um, on what happened, uh, you know, get to people while the incident is still fresh in their minds, and then potentially even settle things very quickly. Now, this, of course, raises concerns, too, because it may mean that people don't have as much time to think about whether they need legal representation to make those, those choices. Um, but so their technology offers a lot of opportunities like that. Uh, you can think about telematics also giving a lot of that information. Now, at the same time, you know, uh, telematics, uh, for instance, is limited in what information it can collect. And so uh, one might very well be able to, if one understands uh, the, how information and what information is being collected by the insurance company, one could probably simulate uh, something that looks like uh, an event where insurance, uh, a claim could be made. Uh, and so it potentially opens up uh, the risk of someone creating a fraudulent claim. So, um, so those things are, are all possibilities. Uh, and, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see where things go. Uh, you know, I mentioned blockchain earlier. There's, there's certain technologies that may be simplify uh, uh, some of the risks out there, uh, the, the treatment of risks. Uh, and, but no doubt, uh, uh, this is not the most technical term, but it, uh, I guess it's sort of like a game of whack-a-mole. It doesn't, uh, you know, you address one way people with technology, people can uh, can take uh, take uh, can it can take advantage of the insurance companies and you're, you're likely to find new routes uh, being opened up to individuals, right? 
so I hope that answers the question. Um, and uh, sorry for the unorthodox analogy, but um, just seemed to like the thing to do. So not at all. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. So, um, uh, so uh, as I was saying, uh, insurance, uh, you know, indemnifies, and it's critical for us to make sure that people can't profit off of it. So, when we're thinking about insurance, uh, we have to, uh, you know, make sure that individuals are only compensated for the loss they face. Right. Uh, Law of large numbers, well, this goes back to the, what I was saying earlier, that one thing that I think is really interesting is how risk can actually be dissipated. It can go away. Uh, it can be ta- uh, as a result of the insurance process of transferring risk. So uh, for an individual, if you think auto insurance, every time they get in a car, they're at risk of an accident, and that's a loss. Um, and, but it's, a, it's infrequent. It's not likely to occur, but when it happens, it's a big deal for the individual. Well, when an insurance company sells auto insurance contracts to a large number of people, um, they protect those individuals from the risk by compensating them for those losses. Uh, And then at the same time, uh, they are able to, uh, once they bring all of that risk into the company, uh, they're actually able to manage that risk effectively. Uh, Assuming that all those risks are unrelated or independent from each other, uh, it becomes actually very predictable that each month the company can expect a certain amount of losses. They don't know who's going to have a loss, but they have a good sense that some number of people will, and a pretty good guess of how much money it's going to cost them. Right? So the risk for the insurance company is relatively low, uh, and so we see risk basically disappearing to some degree. Right? Not that insurance companies face no risk at all, but there is an, a, a sort of a, um, a lessening of risk in, within the economy as a result. Uh, and then finally, we have to think about with insurance products, when there might be an insurance product that would work, it's got to be an insurable interest, meaning, uh, you know, it's got to be something that uh, where the individual that's insuring uh, themselves would face a loss of some sort if this occurred. So a driver's car, uh, the death of a company CEO, the company might have an insurance policy on the CEO. Um, uh, and, you know, but the, the thing is, is you can't, uh, you sh- we want to keep the, the, the losses tied directly to the insured, right? Uh, without that, uh, it becomes very difficult to have the incentives necessary for insurance to work effectively. All right, so let's think a little bit about some issues related to insurance pricing, because I think there's some really uh, interesting stuff uh, with this uh, that maybe, you know, when one, do- when one buys insurance, one doesn't think about. So some key issues when we're pricing, when people are pricing or companies price insurance. Um, so I know here that so insurance markets differ from traditional markets in many ways. Insurance markets don't look like the market for fast food hamburgers or for cars. Uh, and, uh, and so because they behave differently, there are different issues that, that pop up in them. They're unique to these types of markets and other similarly structured markets. So adverse selection, uh, moral and morale hazard, uh, equity, when we think about equity, actuarial versus social equity, uh, and then there are these interesting dynamics and timing uh, in insurance markets. So I want to go through each of these uh, relatively qu- quickly to give you just a taste of what these, these really are. Um, so adverse selection. Uh, one of the things I would say is that uh, insurance is interesting because insurers don't know uh, the cost of their business on the front end. When they sell a product, they don't know how much it's going to cost them whereas most companies do know this uh, on the front end uh, when they produce a product. They know how much it costs. Uh, and uh, why don't they know how much uh, a product they're going to sell costs? Well, uh, in part, it's because of selection. They don't necessarily know uh, how risky the person is that they've sold their product to. They may have a guess about how, how risky on average a person is, uh, but they don't know about the particular people they're selling to. Uh, and you might think about uh, this kind of relates to the idea of um, the Affordable Care Act and the mandate to buy insurance. Uh, the, you know, the, this was really partnered with the idea of uh, uh, also making it so insurance companies are unable to uh, deny consumers for pre-existing conditions. Uh, and uh, with those two things paired, uh, one avoided the selection, a potential selection problem, 
One worry right now, and now there are other things that have been done to try to potentially address this, but one worry with the mandate gone, but the, the requirement that insurance companies still uh, can't deny people for pre-existing conditions is that uh, we'll have a situation where the people who are most likely uh, to buy health insurance are the ones that are most likely to be sick. Uh, and this then becomes a problem for insurance companies because their costs go up. All right, so that selection problem is a big deal, uh, potentially. Um, how do insurance uh, companies deal with that? Well, uh, one thing uh, we might think about uh, is uh, the use of data. I mentioned earlier that data collection, one thing driving data collection is the ability for insurers to gain more information on who they're selling to and really identify the costs associated with that. So that's a real benefit to data collection. Uh, but, of course, then the, we do have these real issues with privacy. Uh, you know, what information is relevant? What's fair to be collected? What's appropriate to be collected? Uh, how much information is too much? And where do we have to draw the line? And how is it stored and who owns the information? Do I, as the insured, own my own information? And so if I decide to take my business elsewhere, my information goes with me? Or does the insurance company get to keep my information and use that uh, in the future? Uh, so these are big questions, and, you know, there, there are questions we're, we're running into we haven't fully addressed yet, and it'll be interesting to see where these questions go. Uh, moral and morale hazard, uh, this all stems from the issue of uh, incentives. When, when you protect people from risk, uh, you create the opportunity for them to change their behavior. Right? Now, moral hazard, uh, is, is really dealing with the idea of people, you, you know, committing fraud, acting dishonestly uh, as a result of uh, the change of their protection from risk. Uh, morale hazard is really just that, okay, I don't face the same risks, so now I behave uh, in a slightly riskier fashion, right, because I'm going to be compensated if things go badly for me. Uh, so these are common problems uh, in auto insurance and liability products. Uh, oftentimes we have... Uh, risk sharing sort of features in policies like deductibles where individuals have to pay the first maybe thousand dollars of uh, a claim in order to try to reduce the incentive uh, for uh, or the, the, the incentive problems that are created by insurance. Uh, this idea then of actuarial uh, and equity versus social equity uh, I mean this gets into a, this definitely gets into an area of um, policy what is fair discrimination? Right? And that's something for states, for legislatures to decide, voters. Um, where do we draw lines uh, about what's acceptable or not? Uh, and different states have drawn these in different places. Some states it's fair to discriminate based on gender and marital status, and other states it's not. Age uh, is also sometimes that can be, dis uh, can be a, a characteristic that we can alter rates on. We can discriminate and alter rates on. In other states, one can't do that. So all states still have some form of law that prohibits unfair discrimination. It's just the definition of what that is varies from state to state. Right. And then when we think about equity, there are sort of two ideas here. Actuarial equity, there the idea is just that uh, insurance companies, you know, uh, oftentimes we, should, we think of them as uh, having, uh, providing a service that should be in line with the cost. That, so insurance should be paying uh, a premium that's in line with the risk uh, that they pose. Right? Uh, and this oftentimes uh, is follows directly from cost-based pricing. The insurance companies set the price for their insurance products based on the risk that someone uh, represents. Uh, when we think about social equity, we think about different things. And these gonna, again get to sort of more moral issues about, well, who should, who should uh, have to pay and by how much? So, um, you know, is pricing, should pricing for insurance be related to people's ability to pay. So this, this again goes to the Affordable Care Act. Uh, some of the issues that were being addressed there and that we're still thinking through today. Uh, and then uh, we also have to think about factors outside of the control of the, of the individual insureds. Uh, say I was born uh, with a, uh, a heart defect uh, and uh, puts me at a greater risk of a heart attack. It's nothing I had any control over, and maybe there's nothing I can do about it to, ma to manage that risk. Um, should I pay more for insurance as a result of that? Um, 
or should I be able to insure myself by that and thus uh, from that and thus not have to pay more for insurance, get the same policy for the same price? These are all tricky issues. Uh, and then the final component I wanted to mention was timing. Uh, and in insurance, this is uh, different types of insurance have different types of losses. So short tail losses um, are easy to settle. They're typically they, the losses have a very recognized value, so it's easy to assess how much an insured has to pay upon making a claim. They're typically settled very quickly. So think about a tree falling on a car. Uh, we know the value of the car. Uh, if the car has to be replaced or fixed, it's easy to talk about compensating a consumer, uh, an insurance consumer for that. Long tail losses are a different animal altogether. So some losses take a long time uh, to develop uh, and are difficult to value and settle as well. So think about, uh, <clears throat> we can think about auto insurance and accidents where someone is injured. Uh, it may take six months for them to recover uh, and for the medical bills to come in. Uh, it could take longer. Uh, there may still be long-term consequences in an inability to work. There may be a whole, a whole host of issues where the costs take time to develop uh, and thus it takes time to settle that case. Uh, the longer the tail, um, uh, the, 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 more of a, or the more risky uh, the business is for insurance companies. Uh, and we can think about very long tails. Think about bodily injury claims related to asbestos. Uh, these this claims, long tail claims could be over, you know, decades even. Right? So uh, business, when we're thinking about insurance companies signing contracts, as I said earlier, they don't know the cost up front of what they're dealing with. Well, you think about long, term, long tail losses, well, that becomes really difficult. They've got to try to predict what sort of cost they're going to face years down the line. All right, so... So we have this idea of insurance uh, and some of the, the difficulties uh, or the, the characteristics that are sort of unique to insurance products. Uh, one thing that we might think about, well, what, are, what sort of things can be insured? And especially as technology is changing risks that we face uh, and the insurance needs that we have, uh, we can think about the characteristics of insurable risks uh, as a way to think about, well, what kind of markets for, of insurance products may develop in the future to address the risks associated with technologies. Um, you know, and, and to put an example out there, think about, um, you know, self-driving cars uh, over the next 20 years uh, and how that changes auto insurance. Uh, and what would auto insurance look like in a world where cars now drive themselves? Um, or what will they look like in a world where some cars drive themselves and some don't, all right? So a couple of basic characteristics uh, you need a large quantity of similar, looking, of similar people that look the same in terms of risk so you can assess the likelihood of a loss and how significant that loss might be. Um, losses have to be fortuitous. Uh, you can't have insurance when people have control over when they have a loss or not. Um, that just invites fraud. Uh, the amount of an expected loss has to be predictable. That's uh, uh, Otherwise, firms on the front end can't make an assessment about the, the price they should set for insurance contracts. Uh, you can't, we, insurance companies can't take on uh, risks that would, if they came, uh, came uh, if they actually occurred, uh, would be catastrophic to the level the insurer would go out of business. Uh, so there are certain types of risks, say flood insurance, that are difficult for companies to insure uh, in the current setting, or have been at least in the past. Um, it also is critical that uh, if an event occurs where there's a loss, that the time, location, and the extent of the loss can be determined. Parties have to be able to agree on this to uh, then uh, use the contract to uh, address the loss. Uh, and then, uh, you, know, the, you know, this really relates back to this catastrophic issue, but uh, you know, covering that loss has to be uh, covering losses uh, has to be feasible for that ins the insurer. Right? Uh, even if they're not catastrophic, you have to have to worry. You have to worry about too many losses at once, um, and the, the insurer's cash flow, all sorts of issues uh, to determine whether the insurer can provide the product. All right. So, uh, characteristics of an insurance product. Uh, I want to mention these briefly. I won't go too quick. I'll go pretty quickly through these. But 
Uh, one thing that makes insurance sort of unique is that its benefits are relatively intangible. Uh, and, you know, I, I have this conversation with people oftentimes where they complain about paying their insurance premiums and getting nothing for it. But, of course, you know, they are getting the protection from the risk. They've been lucky enough not to suffer a loss. Right. And so, uh, but that's something that's difficult for insurance companies because oftentimes uh, you have people that pay the insurance company but money but, but and receive no direct sort of tangible benefit. And, of course, when they do receive a tangible benefit from the insurance company, uh, they're oftentimes dealing with a very unpleasant circumstance uh, and emotions are running high. Uh, and so it's a difficult situation. Uh, um, all right, so we have this intangibility issue. And now coming back to the issue I was mentioning earlier about why I brought up legal contracts, uh, insurance products are oftentimes very complex, uh, and people don't have the legal background to understand the nature of the contracts. Uh, I, wanna, I might ask you know, everyone who's listening to this to you think for themselves, how often do they read carefully the declaration pages in the insurance packet they receive for the insurance policies they have? Right? And how often do you go through the fine print so issues, um, and I'll, I'll say myself, I don't do that as carefully as I probably should. Um, so we have issues about breadth of coverages. Uh, people oftentimes are confused about what all is covered. Um, or even if they understand uh, that a particular thing is covered, they may not realize the limits of that coverage in terms of how big of a loss is covered versus how much of a loss they're still exposed to. Uh, also, uh, at, given that I, you know, I said that um, insurance policies or legal contracts, uh, we have these sorts of issues where, uh, you know, there are oftentimes going to be roles where lawyers uh, are going to be necessary to resolve issues between insurance companies and insureds. Uh, and this oftentimes will go then to courts uh, and it can even rise to be issues uh, that legislators and regulators have to deal with um, in order to really settle. Uh, and then, so I want to finish here with this idea about, well, why, why should we regulate insurance markets? Uh, and uh, one of the things I would say is that I mentioned earlier that insurance markets are different uh, from traditional markets in a variety of ways. Uh, and uh, as a result, we have a situation when, when economists model insurance markets, what we find is actually that, at least with the latest models that we have, uh, is that they are much more volatile. They are not as stable as markets uh, for, you know, automobiles or uh, what, name almost any good. Um, uh, and the reason for that is that insurers are not just setting uh, prices and selling however many units they can sell. They also sell. Uh, they also set besides the price the quantity of insurance that an individual can purchase from them. So it's not just the number of policies, it's how much coverage they get with each one of those policies. And that can vary. And that creates um, a dynamic in insurance markets that uh, makes them different. Uh, so if we're thinking about regulation basics, when we think about there are several elements we might think about, consumer protection. So, uh, you know, given the complexity, it's useful, uh, it's valuable to regulate and standardize insurance policies. So consumers don't have to read the fine print all the time to know what they have in terms of protection. We also can think about, um, uh, you know, insurance regulators oftentimes engage in market conduct exams to make sure that uh, companies aren't engaging in unfair, what are determined by the state, uh, what have been determined by the state as unfair trade practices. Uh, oftentimes, departments of insurance will have places where insurance consumers can register complaints and that then becomes a foundation for examining to make sure that insurance companies are providing the services as they're, as they're expected to. Um, and then finally, we have this idea of ensuring uh, that insurance is available and affordable. Uh, and that's really going to tie back to this, this second point I'm going to mention, uh, insurer solvency. Uh, one thing that happened before there, was great, before there was regulation of insurance markets was you would have sort of boom and bust cycles in insurance markets where individuals would buy insurance policies at relatively low prices, uh, and then the insurance companies that sold the policies at those prices in the end wouldn't have earned enough money off of those premiums to be able to, to meet all the claims they were eventually going to have to pay, and they'd go out of business. And so individuals would seem to have insurance, and then they'd find out later that the, the insurance company went out of business and they actually didn't get any 
uh, protection from their risk. So a lot of regulation is in place to make sure that firms don't make too much in the way of profits, but also to make sure that they don't make too little, right, so that they can pay the claims that they need to. Uh, and this, is a, 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 this serves uh, the, certainly the public interest, uh, uh, depending on how one conceives of that, of course. Um, and uh, there's also a, a regulation to make sure that the funds that insurers uh, uh, invest before they have to pay out their claims uh, will uh, invest them in safe enough assets so that they will be able to have access to them as needed. Uh, so I think I, I'll, I'll stop there. I think that's that's probably enough. I'd, I'd be happy to field any questions uh, if there are more questions. Um, and if not, it's been a real pleasure to have the opportunity to talk. Dr. Shaver, we, we thank you very much for sharing your insights. It's been an informative hour and enlightening hour. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time uh, for today's webinar, uh, but we thank you for uh, sharing your expertise with us. Uh, also, uh, a special thanks to Representative George Kaiser, NCSL Task Force Co-Chair, for his opening remarks and for his support and encouragement for today's webinar. We appreciate that. Uh, most importantly, on behalf of both the NCSL and the Griffith teams, we thank all of our audience uh, participants for joining us this afternoon. Uh, let me note that this webinar has been recorded. It will be available on the NCSL website. If you missed any part of the program or you'd like to recommend it to a colleague, it will soon be available. Um, finally, be sure to check the NCSL website for information about future NCSL Griffith Foundation collaborative programming. We look forward to uh, bringing you some additional topics uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Uh, for now, I'm Frank Paul Tomasello at the Institute's Griffith Foundation. Uh, on behalf of our colleagues and friends at NCSL, we thank you for joining us and uh, bid you a pleasant good afternoon.